name is Sarah Labar. I'm the executive director and curator here at Artwork Center for Contemporary Art. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. We have two uh, galleries. This is the South Gallery. We also have the North Gallery on the north side. We also have 28, <laughs> 28 artist studios. Um, here, so I would like for, to first thank the Aryan Family Foundation, the Community Foundation of Northern Colorado, and Colorado Creative Industries for making tonight possible. Every even year, Artworks asks our resident artists to come up, come together under one topic and create a group exhibition. This exhibition, Power, is composed of 17 of our resident artists' work. Each artist created a piece exemplifying various forms of power how it can manifest culturally, environmentally, and creatively. When thinking about the topic for this biennial exhibition, I wanted to speak about the last two years of cultural, environmental, and social upheaval in our country and beyond, but I didn't want to cur uh, curate a call that was about any one specific topic. I needed to find something broad enough to honor each artist's interpretation, so I settled on the word power. Power can be layered. It's misunderstood, feared, and revered. One can think of abuse of power, police brutality, manipula manipulation and advertisement, as in August's piece of liminal behind us here, and the great injustices put upon indigenous children in our country, as in Susan White's piece, Power is Never Neutral, here in the center. One can think of the power of nature. <laughs> Come on in, artists. As in Matt Schaefer's piece, Power of Nature of Power, he says nature exudes a non-conscious power that is profound and without agenda. Power can be strength from within. As in Amy Villapondo's piece, Balancing It All, she says power is the sense of accomplishment by achieving balance. Ana Maria Botero, writes about her piece's journey in a thousand miles, and we'll be looking at those later. Sometimes fundamental changes come gradually, one drop at a time, like water dripping for many years, carving mountains of stone. This is the power of incremental change over time. As you can see, the seemingly obvious prompt power inspired a myriad of responses from artists and a poet working in various mediums and backgrounds. I hope that after tonight's event, each of you takes with you the discovery about what power means to you. Thanks so much. So we get to hear from the artists now, and we're going to work count or clockwise through the gallery. Uh, and first up, we have Jenny Milner to talk about her piece. Thank you. <laughs> um, OK, I am a mural painter and a metalsmith, and I um, I only have five minutes. I'm gonna go really quick. I'm just gonna read the poem that goes with this read one. It. It's too long. I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna talk about it instead. You can read okay. the poem when you're ready. Um, this is a very unpopular thing to paint about, motherhood. <laughs> it's something nobody wants wants to know about me. It, it It's so strange, because I live two lives. I live this artist's life, where I'm out in the street getting almost arrested for writing my name on walls. <laughs> And then I have this other <laughs> life where I raise kids and hope they do all the things that they're supposed to. And so this poem is about a moment. I mean, the painting is about a moment. And it's not the most glamorous part of motherhood. It's the part where you kind of want to kill your children, <laughs> and, but you have to feed them. And so it's, a, it's called Sea Girl, and she goes out into the ocean, brings home the halibut, throws it on the ground, and it's the, it's the perspective of the kids. Like, this is the angriest she's ever been. And so she is my favorite um, expression when I'm painting faces is this unapologetic apathy. And so she's really tried to decide if I wanted chocolate. She At the end of the poem, she's dripping wet on the floor and she's throwing chocolate wrappers on the floor. And I really wanted to put chocolate wrapper in her fingers, but I kind of like her the way she is. Kind of, like, whatever. Peace out, people. <laughs> like, eat your halibut. You know. um, but it's kind of, 
it's kind of my favorite, which is why it's $4,500, because I was hoping nobody else would take it home. Um, and it matches my bedroom, so it's gonna, it's gonna be the only piece of artwork that I live with. So that's huge for me. And it took over a month to paint her hair, and I was across the hall from Michael Simon. Am I saying his name right? Michael Anthony Simon. Michael Anthony, missed a word. Um, and he spent so much time painting the same painting for months and all the hours that he put in, and I'm kind of a hit and run painter. I can paint a giant mural in five days. And so um, my goal was to be more like Michael and sit and contemplate and um, paint this hair. And so I did, I did it for a whole month and I fell in love with her, which means that if I don't hit and run, maybe there'll be some things that come out of my studio that are more powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, nice. This quirky thing I made <laughs> called the Milky Light of Spring. When I got thinking about um, power, um, one of the words that really came to me first was resilience. And when uh, somebody in the Osher class that I teach said, uh, added a prompt that was, what do you grow? I said, I grow snowdrops. <laughs> they come up on their own. And uh, I really love that, all their little bold ways of being. <clears throat> so what I focused on was that although we as humans have power, we use it in both wonderful and horrific ways, but what we don't seem to understand is how little we understand, not just about ourselves, but about the so often beautiful physical world around us. And that is what <clears throat> focused me on bulbs and first on snowdrops. And so I want to read that poem to you. Um, and then I won't read the middle lines because they're, they're wonderful to understand if you read the poem closely, but <laughs> hard, a little hard to read. The Milky Light of Spring. <clears throat> Snowdrop's genus is Galanthus, or milk flower. The Milky Light of Spring rises from snowdrops as they come up, stem curved, neck bowed, devotional. Three petals hang like silent bells, three inner petals edged in green. From underground through seams in soil, they protest that winter should give way. They form villages with pale urchins, then wild drifts, then clouds. Snowdrops travel, luring ants to disperse seeds, gaining borderless regions of dirt Triplet petals make a hardy trinity, mother, daughter, the holiest of ghosts. In the language of flowers, snowdrop means hope or sorrow and hope, two tendrils that blossom souls. Those who shiver and cry, I can't do this again, receive instructions. But the truth is this, buried underground, Grandmother bulbs keep telling stories of sun and green. Soon everyone believes and surges up into risky, gauzy light. Tiny white choirs singing yes to bulbs, no to the powers that be. <clears throat> so these are little intended to be parts of the little tendrils, those little silky things. <clears throat> and then I thought I would just finish off with this very short poem by Kim Stafford. It's called Advice from a Raindrop. You think you're too small to make a difference? Tell me about it. You think you're helpless at the mercy of forces beyond your control? Been there. Think you're doomed to disappear? <coughs> Just one small voice among millions? That's no weakness, trust me. That's your wild card, your trick your implement. They won't see you coming until you're there, in their faces, shining, festive, expendable, eternal. Sure you're small, just one small part of a storm that changes everything. 
That's how you win, my friend, again and again and again. called the 37 year project 37 years old um, I've been working on this one for a long time uh, when I was starting to think about what power meant to me um, I was thinking about where it comes from who gives it to you uh, if you claim it for yourself what that process is um, I love myself I love my entire life changed uh, the I last few years, as a lot of ours did, myself. and I think one of the biggest lessons that I took I out of that is that I'm responsible for myself, myself. and how I feel I about myself, how I feel in the world. Um, yeah, things can happen in your life, but I have me, and I love myself, um, and that's about all I have to say. <laughs> Okay, so power and unseen force have manifested in the alchemy of transformation. The lotus represents the body and the physical world. Excuse my uh, hoarse voice. <laughs> I'm not sick. And uh, what I want to speak about is the metaphor, metaphors of the axis of the body and the mind in the spirit world. And the lamp. Uh, represents the mind and the spirit. Um, the lotus represents the profane and the sacred in the lamp. The I'm throwing out these these terms because it's such a big topic. There's no way that I could talk about all of this all at once. So I'm going to let you make the connection between the two. Um, the lotus would represent rebirth into the limitations of physical bodies that we're born into. We're born in the mud. We're born out of the blood of our mother's wounds, our guts, and we die into, we, we die with the decay of our bodies. And we go into the spirit world of expanded limit without limitation. The lotus represents the visibility of the four elements earth, fire, air, and water. And the lamp represents mystery of pure energy and power in the other world. The lotus represents sensations versus inspiration. Faith versus knowing. Innocence versus experience. So the two are on this axis of the physical world and the limitless world of infinity. The transformation of al uh, alchemy in clay is a metaphor for me. It's a metaphor of a billions of particles suspended in water. And it's malleable, it's delicate, and it's earth and water. Through fire and air, it's fused into a solid whole that becomes an individual universe unto itself, capable of containment. And the lamp is the movement and the inspiration that comes into us, into our bodies as an artist. And these two pieces, when I, I had to, excuse me, my voice is bad. Um, 
when the first idea of power came in, I go, how am I going to show power in a piece of clay, a humble piece of clay? And I just turned myself over to the concept. And literally, I didn't plan either of the two pieces. They both made themselves. And that is the power of transformation. Hey, Grant Allen. This is my painting. Um, in January, Thich Nhat Hanh died. He was a Buddhist monk. Um, he had influenced thousands, maybe millions of people um, around the world. He was known as Thai to his, um, to his students. And he was, um, he was really an amazing man. He'd been sick for quite a few years. So it wasn't any big shock or surprise that he passed on, but um, he, meant, he meant a lot to me because he would talk about just the most simple of things like breathing just friggin' breathe. And that's a very powerful message. He did a whole series of calligraphic um, paintings where he would do a circle. The ink was partly made of his the tea that he was drinking at the time. I assume he used a different teacup for that part. And would write a word in it. This particular one, he it was, this is it. So I'm referencing that and paying homage to those paintings he did and what I set before myself with this one was to make sort of a breathing painting. So on the in-breath, I breathed in peace. On the exhale, I breathed out love. And I tried to do that with every single stroke in here. And it was really actually kind of a challenging because sometimes you just want to go faster. And it was like, no, you know, even where marks are repeated, I had to slow down to go, no, we're inhaling peace, we're exhaling love. Inhaling peace, exhaling love. And that was the process. The rest is paint on a piece of wood. It's a hopeful piece for me because even with everything going on in the world, we're all just made of energy. Every one of us, everything, Everything we can see, touch, feel, it's all just energy. And we can control energy. And one of the ways we do that is to inhale peace and exhale love. And if all of us were, say, to do that tomorrow for one minute, that would be like a half hour's worth of love and peace in the world. And if you liked it and wanted to do two for two or three minutes, <laughs> This is, this is how the stuff continues. So that's what that's about for me. And um, when we had the title Power, I was thinking, what should I do? Because I, for the people who know me, I always avoid conflict and I always try to be like behind the curtain. I don't want to be talking in front of everyone. <laughs> So I was thinking in the material that I started using last year, which is cardboard, that is a very common and simple material, and how can I express the power? So I came with the idea, or the, I came, no, I know the idea that you can change something 180 degrees, just gentle, just one at a time. So this is the idea, it's, it's just, I'm rotating those pieces, I'm just doing rotations, just one layer, and another layer, and another layer. And I think this is powerful because without a huge force, you can change many, many things, just step by step. You don't have to be showing everyone, just on your place, like breathing. <laughs> One at a time, um, you can make a beautiful things in this world. So those are, um, this is, uh, I forgot the name, <laughs> Thousand Miles and a Journey. Um, this is my piece. Uh, power is never neutral, and it couldn't be more true today than ever because of what's happened in Texas. So 
Um, the premise for me is that as a country and as little towns, we all came together and made schools. And schools were about educating children on different levels. And um, by the nature of them being part of a community, those communities also influenced what those children were taught. And um, as time goes on, I actually the, what facilitated the piece itself was the acrimony um, that was happening on our school boards and our local school board. And that even our school board members were in fear of their lives because of people's perspectives. And um, then with what happened in Texas, I just feel like the powers that have established the gun laws are not neutral. They pretend to be neutral, but they're not neutral. So I guess that's all I have to say. <laughs> Uh, I'm sharing a drawing titled Power of Nature of Power, a title that uh, sort of deliberately chases its own tail. And uh, I'm trying to promote a, a form of cyclical thinking. Uh, I'm depicting a pair of dragonfly wings here, and I'm using the sort of simple conventions of biological illustration straight out of every eighth grade earth science textbook you've ever seen. <laughs> so uh, so my, my core discipline is architecture. So I come to visual art uh, kind of through that lens, through the lens of architectural design. Uh, I chose nature as a subject uh, to discuss power because I think there's something fundamentally different about how nature uh, sort of embraces power versus how human beings do. Um, so I'm gonna make some arguments here. Nature is essentially composed of countless layers and interdependencies. Uh, nature is non-conscious, at least from the, you know, in comparison to the way human beings are conscious. And nature is largely without agenda. So by contrast, human beings are, you know, we are the dominant species, right? We can move our thumb like this. So uh, it makes, uh, makes things quite a bit different for us. We are, we are conscious, we are agenda driven. So we have sort of regarded nature as a limitless resource and uh, used it as such. So there's a, <laughs> as us as human beings exercising control over nature and uh, nature is, a, or rather control is a form of power. So uh, these, are, these are thoughts kind of running around in my head. How do we, uh, how do, we do better? And I, I very simplistically think that emulating nature is probably more intelligent way to act as as people and as a civilization. So in the last several years I've come across the concept of biomimicry, which is a familiar term to some and, and maybe not others, but uh, essentially it's uh, learning and applying lessons from nature to support conditions conducive to life. And so this is something I take to my architectural practice and uh, it's, the core principles are basically emulate nature, share ethos with nature, and connect and reconnect with nature at every opportunity. So uh, the, the reason for dragonfly wings is it's one of the only symbols kind of universally that I've found has a positive connotations. And uh, some of the more uh, the ones that catch my attention the most are change, transformation, adaptability, and self-realization. Thank you. Thank you. Can talk about mine real quick? Hi, my name is Elizabeth Seriani. I'm also the gallery manager here. 
Um, so this piece, um, when it originally started, um, when Sarah brought up the idea of power, I was originally going to do a landscape. She looked at it and said, you can do better. And so I did. Um, so <laughs> which was fine. It worked. <laughs> it worked out really well. So this piece is titled, uh, a really nice long one, Chromophobia, a fear of contamination and corruption through color, something that is unknown or uh, appears unknowable. This quote is actually from a book that I've been reading. It's called Chromophobia, and it is from the author um, David Batchelor. I would highly recommend it. Definitely messes with your brain. Um, but this piece specifically and the book is based on the idea of how in Western aesthetics, there is a separation between, I guess, artistic materials and ideas. So for instance, um, we have masculine forms. So that would be drawing, sculpture, line, form, architecture, all these things. But color specifically is seen as feminine, infantile, exotic, something that is uncontrollable and needs to be controlled. And you see that a lot with women and BIPOC community on top of that. And so this piece specifically, I did a study on Cellini's um, Medusa, wow, Perseus with the head of Medusa and the 55 main colors, <laughs> color scheme from Artemisia Gentileschi's Judith beheading Holoferns. And so I wanted to take two historical pieces, one that showed um, masculine, masculine power over a feminine form while in the background having a also historical work that was taking power back and recreating that imbalance or equaling out the scales a little bit. But the way that I wanted to do this, I ended up doing all the painting, whatnot, and instead of the bronze work like the original sculpture is, I wanted to create it into marble, into white marble, so that it has that pure masculine form about it and make it more obvious of the paint dripping over it, the colors dripping from this very gruesome painting, <laughs> essentially. I love it, um, but it's a very gruesome work. And essentially the paint would drip over it and dirty up this sculpture and make it more balanced once again, the power balance once again. So that is my work. That does it. Oh, Sharon says, contemplating Dr. Martin Luther King's writings about power and love inspired me to create Street Shine One, Love Without Power, Power Without Love a pop-up mini installation for ACCA's Exhibition Power, made with mundane, everyday materials, including recycled cardboard, dollar store kitchen bling, chalk, and pine cones. In, re in his report to the 10th Annual Session of the S Southern Christian Leadership Conference on August 16, 1967, in, in Atlanta, Georgia, Dr. King stated, one of the greatest problems of history is that the concepts of love and power are usually contrasted as polar opposites. Love is identified with a res resignation of power and power with a denial of love. What is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive, and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. Justice at its best is love, correcting everything that stands against love. I'll give you a moment to take that in. Our great Dr. Martin Luther King. Most shrines in the world are dedicated to a saint, a goddess or god, an element, a subject, and street shine, and, and street shine one love without power, power without love, is dedicated to our pineal gland, which is right here. The gland, the, the gland Descartes called the seed of the soul and thought to facilitate our connection to the divine. So she writes, 
More information about Street Shine One is available on my blog. Please touch at Carlisle Art Studio at blogs.blogspot.com uh, or I welcome you to contact me for a tour and a chat about the work. Cards with my contact info are available on the wall outside my studio, number 121 on the north side. Hi, I'm Amy Gilfondo. This is my painting, Balancing It All. Power to me is um, comes from within, and the way I've been trying to achieve that for a lifetime now is through yoga and meditation. And um, it has been a lifetime discipline that I still feel like I'll be learning up until I'm 100 years old. And uh, I think that the feeling that I get after I do yoga and meditation is such a incredible feeling that I wish I could bottle up and give to everybody. But I feel like everybody has that power within to find it. And it is so important um, to feel grounded, especially in this day and age. Um, like I said, meditation is a discipline. And um, there's a Zen proverb that says, it suggests that you sit and meditate for 20 minutes each day. And unless you're super, super busy, then you should meditate for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot to be said just about that. It's, we have a tendency to have monkey mind, as it's called, where you have a lot of things going on and you feel like everything's scattered. And it's a, it's a challenge to bring it all back down to a center. But that center has power, and with that power, magic can happen. So um, that's the main premise behind the idea is the meditation. And in the month of February, I joined a drawing a day group on Facebook. And um, it's totally out of my realm to do that, so I was a little nervous about it. And just before that, I came across a technique of drawing called neurographic drawing. And it's kind of a meditation in motion. And so I just went ahead with that uh, technique and trusting an intuition with doing this drawing a day. And um, I learned that uh, it was very calming and that I craved it. And um, the idea of neurographic, the term is um, actually the whole technique has um, come about by a uh, Russian scientist, uh, psychologist, uh, Piskov, I'm gonna get that wrong, Pavel Piskarev. And the process, um, you know, basically comes up with these lines and this technique of lines that uh, resemble the neurons in your brain. So um, this technique has been proven to um, help with anxiety and depression and you know all kinds of different things. So um, I really latched onto it. And it also just gave me something to do without trying to think of something to draw every day for this drawing a day, because that was kind of nerve wracking in itself. <laughs> so just being able to just go with this intuitive um, style was uh, really freeing and um, opened up a whole new body of work for me. And um, so anyway, I guess uh, the whole power concept is something that we can control within. Despite what's happening in the world, we can always come back to center. And that's sometimes the only control that we do have, but it is within everybody's power. I'm August Dalbeau, uh, this is my piece here, Subliminal. And uh, you know, the word power is a very broad word, very heavy word. And so there's a lot of ways you go with it. You know, like I thought power of water, power, like just the word power, it's a heavy word. I mean, it's five letters, but it's, it's a big word. Um, so there's a lot of ways to go with it. And uh, I thought back to when my older brother was here today, um, we went to the Prado in Madrid and we saw the Francisco Goya's 14 black paintings. And they're in this room that it's that's a powerful room and um 
It's dark, dark walls, dimly lit. And it just, there's something about, besides the paintings themselves that are just like dark of themselves and have a certain power to them. But it made me think, just like the dimly lit room, made me think, would they look the same or would they have the same impact on like a white wall like this with the not like natural light that's coming through here. I mean, there's no natural light in the room. So it was just like this dim lit room that had these 14 really gruesome dark paintings that really gave you some insight into how it was feeling in early 1800s. Um, so I wanted to play with this idea of using light to kind of have a, give the piece a different feeling based on the lighting of the room it's in, which is why the LED lights are there. Um, this is not my first iteration of the piece. It took a different form prior and um, kind of got, it kind of hit a wall with it where I didn't really like where it was going and I thought it just looked too much of like a prototype. So I started working on a different project uh, just to, you know, clear my head, keep, but stay creative. And I ended up flipping through a bunch of magazines and just, I don't know if you flipped through a magazine recently, but they're all ads. <laughs> and it's, and it really struck me just like, this is just a print magazine, you know? Like what is this happening on our phones where we see ads every single day, constantly. We're just bombarded with these advertisements. And I really think they have a psychological effect that we don't really consider. And so I wanted to speak to the you know, just the power these advertisements have on our heads that's not yet realized by the consumer is what it is. So it has it written on there. This is the power of advertising is not yet realized by the consumer. And I just wanted to, you know, br bring to light that these things are, you know, they're dictating a lot of how we feel about things, what we do, what we purchase, what we find interesting um yeah that's about it i suppose yeah like <laughs> yeah yeah that's what i that's what was powerful to me i guess yeah, that's it take some questions from the i would love to the artists would love to take questions um if you have in any order, doesn't matter. Um, but we've talked about a lot of really interesting things tonight um, about power and so many different avenues to get to where these pieces were created, which I think is really, really interesting. Um, so does anyone want to start off with a question? Yeah. August, did you, um, for your piece, did you select these advertisements specifically or just um, Go for it. What did you do? Well, I mean, I just pulled all of them as I came through them and, you know, ended up with a ton of them. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wanted to pick things that are, you know, I guess that I see as more just like material sort of things that are not really, they don't really have any real meaning, you know, like a watch, like a Rolex watch. I can give a shit about a Rolex watch. <laughs> um, so, like, I mean, they're specifically selected. I mean, especially the Google one there, it says, it says we keep people, I mean, it used to say we keep more people safe online than anyone else in the world. I just like crossed out safe, and it says we keep more people online more than anyone else in the world. <laughs> 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 Which is like, weirdly true, but, um, so yeah, they're selected. Uh, I mean, and compositionally, I kind of just look for color and just things that I found interesting, whether it be like a human figure or the Louis Vuitton on there, I just thought it was kind of a pretty image, so I threw it on there. Mm -hmm. That's because the advertising got to you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Right. Cool. Any other questions? <laughs> what? If not, do you have anything? <laughs> I'd like to know, Elizabeth, <laughs> you asked. Um, this was a, the first iteration of what is going to be a series. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the work that you that this has spawned and where you're going next? Yeah. Okay. Um, so for this, yeah, it's going to be a chromophobia series, essentially. And um, <laughs> Well, I'm working on two current pieces along with another series, so it's a little crazy right now. But one that I'm, I started 
actually the week that the um, Supreme Court leak came out, um, is, oh, I'm so excited for it. Sorry, I'm gonna nerd out. So for <laughs> this next piece, it's going to be a duality, I guess, of this, so Perseus and the head of Medusa on one side of the piece, and on the opposite side, is going to be Medusa with the head of Perseus. Oh. And so with this, you can actually see both of their eyes are kind of slanted downward. They're looking down. He's in a triumphant form. She's dead. But for the, other, the opposite side, Perseus, he's going to be looking down. He's going to look a little, like, dead. But, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but Medusa, instead of looking down, she's going to be going to be glaring Perseus down. So it's going to create this weird triangular form between the, t the four figures, I guess, in a way. And I'm still going to use the same background colors and whatnot, still working that out. But essentially, it's still going to be creating and um, using works from historical pieces. Using historical pieces. There we go. And um, different paintings and feminine, masculine forms, and a bunch of other little ideas. I'm still trying to work it out, but that's the main thing that's going on right now, so. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I have to model that one. <laughs> hmm. I have a comment. I think it's really interesting looking at all of the work as a whole how much meditation has come up and looking inward um, and sort of taking the power back essentially. So I think that's really interesting, especially with Amy's piece. I wanted, you didn't talk much about your process. Could you talk about your process of paper making a little bit? Because I don't think people understand what this is made out of. Okay. Um, recycling in general is something that makes me feel powerful because it's a little bit of you know, something I can do with, you know, the obvious, it's not gonna end up in the landfill. So paper has been um, something I've been making for a couple decades now. Um, my aunt in Chicago taught me her process, which is a really loose process of using recycled office paper and junk mail. And so now I have all of my neighbors trained to give me all their shredded <laughs> bags. <laughs> um, but, um, like I said, I, I really enjoy being able to reclaim something, uh, turn it into something new, give it new life. Um, to me, I think that is another form of power that um, I find um, more and more in the idea of a circular economy where we're all starting to start with things that can be reused, recycled, relived somehow. So. So that's my process of paper making. Anybody have any questions about that? And I love the texture. I have the process, I have the ability to make it really smooth or as textured as I like. And I just love the way that the sunlight hits it during the day and shadows that are cast and just a little sense of, um, I guess, mystery. Some people think it's plaster. And um, so anyway. Process. Is it on a board? Or what it's is actually it? mounted on canvas. Mm -hmm. I like it to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> Do you paint over the top of it? Like yes, what put I it? treat it just like a canvas right. actually. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, mainly because I really was, when I set out doing this, um, this method, I didn't want to put anything behind glass. Right. So it gets treated just like I would treat a canvas. Mm -hmm. and it's nice. Hold me, Amy. Any other questions or comments about power in general? Jenny? I want to ask you how to be. If, if the onion piece was considered for the show, or if you wanted to make something new. That one is not about power, necessarily. <laughs> okay, so Abby did a piece in, in a previous show, a digital piece that was her eating an onion, and it was, it was lovely. Um, but it was about women who mm -hmm. 
eat the onion because they have to. It's a little bit of the unapologetic apathy. I really love that piece. But I was asking her if she wanted, if she considered putting that one in the show. That's a great question. Uh, the the piece that Jenny's speaking about was um, honoring the women in my life that came before me and their stories and reclaiming um, what it means to be a woman in our culture. I believe I made that piece 2020, the end of 2020. Uh, so no, I didn't consider it for the show because um, it's kind of an older piece. And I haven't really shown it other than that. So most people don't know about it. <laughs> um, I, um, one of the things that I like about the performance video work that I do is that it's, um, it becomes a record of my life. Um, as you know, as all of our artwork does, um, it speaks to where I am in my story. And so I think if you were to look back at all of the performance video pieces I've done, you can kind of watch my journey as a woman, um, as a human. And so no, I didn't consider it, um, but it would be interesting to see kind of all of yeah. them lined up in time. Mm -hmm. The ultimate power to me is that, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. that womanhood. <laughs> And it feels also to me like honoring the women in your lives leads to being able to love yourself, which mm -hmm. is a kind of power that we really yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for you, not just because oh. you're standing behind me. <laughs> Sorry, because I've been bumping you. Oh, no, no. no. Um, I was curious, looking at um, the treatment of the surface that your poem is on, is that something that you've always done? Or is did that come about as a result of being your, um, yeah, so, and, and is it an important part of the writing? The other pieces mm -hmm. that are on there? Uh, <clears throat> no, we've done ecrastic shows here where we've had art and a poem about the art or mm -hmm. Uh, or, and sometimes uh, art about the poem, uh, so that's been over time. But this piece was very different, and it was, I call it panic, because <laughs> <laughs> we were trying to finish up the Loveland Poet Laureate program the third year and choose the new Loveland Poet Laureate. And so <clears throat> I looked up some pieces about the snowdrops, mm -hmm. you know, because they do come up and they spread and they they can move, actually, and all of those things. And then when I found that little bit of embroidery, silvery embroidery thread, I thought, oh, these are the tendrils. Mm -hmm. This is what happens underground. Mm -hmm. well, so <clears throat> panic would be interesting. <laughs> 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 That's not much of an explanation. <laughs> Yes. No, I don't always do it that way, but I was just thinking I need to make this more graphic somehow, mm -hmm. this idea. So, mm -hmm. But thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One more. Uh, Susan Frears, how did you mentally come up with this? Mm -hmm. Like the idea of power, yes, but how did you figure out this idea for this piece? If that makes sense. Um, so um, I have been reading that people in this climate are drawn to nostalgia for various reasons, and I thought, well, if if nostalgia makes people pay attention to something and I'm going to use something that is nostalgic to convey my my concept and um, then the, there's even gum on the bottom of the <laughs> <laughs> really old gum <laughs> but um, also because I found the chair at Habitat and uh, it had some very, not a lot of graffiti in the, in the desk part, but enough that it was suggestive of 
doing some wood burning on it, which I thought would also sort of be nostalgic. And um, then the pencils, I, I made a grid to make it really formal. It doesn't look like it anymore because the night of the opening, there were children you know, <laughs> trying to pull the pencils out. <laughs> At one time, they were all pretty secure, but um, I made a grid because it was very formal, like the way school was when I was in school. And um, then the pencils sort of speak to the, to the whole idea of school and your number two pencils and everything being rigid and then and then the power of of school the power of school boards the power of the people that determine what we learn and then as time went on it also became about the Indian schools and um, the guns in schools. And I started out trying to do a piece around every shooting, and there have just become so many that you just can't do it anymore. It's, it's aside from being very depressing, it's also, as much as I don't want it to, it's blending together. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, Elizabeth. That's good, thank you. Okay, if there aren't any more questions, thank you everyone so much for being here. <coughs>